and uh you know like yeah. I, I i did an interview this week with harris eisenstadt who was your student and, who uh, yeah. harris eisenstadt you know the drummer oh yeah 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 and he was yeah. like man where, where, where are you located where are you situated where i'm in slovenia oh slovenia huh yeah like f- former yugoslavia you ever played here yeah yeah i did yeah years ago yeah oh, Zagreb. Wow. Zagreb. Oh, Zagreb, yeah, you go to Croatia, yeah, amazing. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to start uh, asking you, like, I listened to the last record, Samba de Maracatu, and mm-hmm. it's so beautiful uh, okay. what you've done, the compositions and the arrangements, and you know, your mallets, wipes playing is beautiful. And I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you come up with this record? What was the procedure? I mean, you you use some old songs like Circles. I know you know, which is a beautiful five four tune. And but like, what was the progress for this album? Like, where did the main inspiration uh, come from? Uh, well, first of all, when you uh, record <clears throat> record for a company, or and it's pretty much determined by the budget sure. that is presented to you. See, so you. You get a budget and you say, okay, what can I do with this? <laughs> so <clears throat> that determines, it determines a lot of what you're going to do. Yeah. You know, and so uh, as far as, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it's stuff, as far as the concept is, uh, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to do uh, something. Then I had a limit. I had limited orchestration. In other words, mm-hmm. you know, I yeah. had really had an orchestra in mind, a big band, but there was oh that, really oh wow yeah, but the budget wasn't wasn't yeah. there for that. So, uh, I uh, wanted to do something with a uh, maraca too, which is Brazilian. Mm-hmm. That's a Brazilian Somebody contemporary that. Brazilian yeah. rhythm. And it's rooted in the, in the, the Brazilian condom blay and all of that. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do something around that. <clears throat> so uh, I just, well, if it, uh, like to Morocco too. It's, <laughs> it's really like, a, a, it's, it's out of the samba, out of the batricada, but it's contemporary. It's just yeah. became known in the last few years. How did you how did you become familiar with it? I mean, what excited? Where did you get yeah, the excitement from? I, mean, I had heard uh, I had heard uh, uh, well, I'm into Brazilian music, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, then I heard um, oh, Jesus, you know, I can't remember. He's an American dude, and he he was dealing with the Morocco too. Oh, okay, and I heard it, and it. I said, okay, I'd like to do something around that. You know, it has a, because it has a familiar, sounds like kind of New Orleans, has a New Orleans inflection. So I said, yeah, I'd like to do something with the Morocco too. Mm. And so, boom. Yeah. There it is. So, uh, as I said, and you are, what you do is determine, okay, with the limited budget I had, I said, okay, (laughs) then, you know, I can I can't be hiring, and so I'll be the front line and yeah. the back line. I'm the rhythm section and the front line. I can I can do it. Yeah. So that's why I, I did instead of hiring a, a horn player or a mallet player, I'm the mallet player. Yeah. I can be beautiful. the mallet player. Right. Yeah. So I'll lay down the tracks, lay down the rhythm tracks, and just overdub. Everything else, all the percussion mounts over over the rhythm tracks. Oh man, quite it wasn't really complicated at all. No, 
So, so you basically, when you wrote the charts, you you wrote like all the separate, or did you improvise yeah. like making percussions, or like did you make? That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah and in the case of circles, circles is already written and played. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Before and uh, well, the Morocco too. I, I I put that together, and and uh, rest of the tunes were you know I had uh, standard tune, unit yeah. night music, and yeah, I love that. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, the other tunes are, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, Never Let Me Go, all of those songs. Yeah. Very familiar. Everybody's familiar with those songs. So, Yeah. 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 You, you mentioned the budget and uh, the label. So it's like Blue Note. It's, I know you did Mirrors in 1998, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. And uh, did it ever, you, you know, I have you on, I don't know, 30 Blue Note records from the 60s at home. And... Did, did well, they, those, yeah. those guys ever offer you a deal back then for as a leader or they like did. they did they did uh, i have that in the notes it's in that it's in the in the, in the you oh, know okay. the, the notes yeah. uh, the uh alfred lines and i was started recording in with them in 63 yeah so uh, gone way back and breaking uh, point yeah they did uh offer me um a Recording, and they said, but I was just really so spaced. I was content to just re recording, which what I was doing, recording with all yeah. those and touring, making gigs and stuff. I, I, I had no business sense, you know. I just said, yeah, I, I don't want to do nothing, hmm. which is uh, crazy when I look back. I could have, I could have recorded way back then. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe it was for the best, you know. I wasn't ready, so. But you were writing always. I mean, Mirrors is like on Freddie's Breaking Point record, and yeah. Well, I had uh, I was uh, as well as playing drums. You know, I was living in Washington D.C. Hmm. in the '60, and I was playing in a group. We had a job six nights a week for Man. three years. Wow, well, that's the way you got jobs back then, and so. I also was studying. I was studying composition, yes. formal, you know, what they call classical, you know. So I was studying that and playing, and uh, I was studying uh, composition, and I got to a point uh, in the studies that called uh, mirror writing. You ever heard of that? Mirror writing. That's yeah. When yeah. you mirror the melody, right? Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. yeah. You juxtapose stuff. Yeah. So yeah. That's that's what that piece. That's where that piece came from. Yeah, I love, love like that a, yeah. a lesson. It was like a like a a, a school <laughs> a school study piece. Yeah. And uh, but it was it was cool. You know, it was cool enough that they Freddie had heard it and Eric Doffy had heard it, so they could see you know that oh this guy knows what he's doing you know so. So they, he liked it, the harmonies and the movements. So, yeah, that's yeah, it's beautiful. The, the, the two five and yeah. you know the major chords. I love this song. You, I transcribed yeah. it year, years ago, like the melody and the, made a lead sheet. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. that's so so nice. The progressions, the minor chords, then the last part. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, you, you know, mirrors. You said this was like a study piece. Okay, but like that's what what, what, what was. was usually like your progress even now in writing or composing you know even for all the bobby hutcherson records and so many records the compositions you wrote how what is your process usually or how do you start the composition i mean well uh, <clears throat> it's hard well, to describe it you know okay let's say mirrors okay was this was this school lesson piece okay yeah. Now, um, let's say I'll more of it as from a, your yeah, first one. Yeah, that was uh, some some ideas that I had uh, before, and you know, it's, it's it's not like, and even today, it's not like uh, you know, like a professional composer a guy. So okay, here we, I would I would like to commission you. Mm, yeah. I don't I don't get commissions like that. I I got a few things from the Lincoln Center Orchestra. Mm. They commissioned me to write uh, for their uh, show in 2004. Mm. They were featuring uh, drums and percussions. Right. And it wasn't, it, they've gotten me, you know, to write a piece 
for the orchestra. There's no drummers. I'm not saying that, but there are no drummers writing music. You know, mm. that's going back. So I got a commission from there, but commissions are they 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 don't come by you know sure. that frequently. So uh, what I do is uh, I rely on, on uh, old ideas or pieces that I scribbled around years ago, and then I'll go grab it and say, oh, that's pretty good. I can, you know, I can work with that, you know, and like that. That's, that's, that's the way it goes. But yeah. if you get a recording, if you get a recording date, yeah. which this is, and then that's like a commission in a sense. So yeah, yeah, that is like a commission. So you have a whole program to get together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. But do, do, did you have, let's say, I don't know, components, the record, you know, which has that, more all of that beautiful. That was, that was all like school. Ah, really? <laughs> yeah, that was school, school stuff. School really? Pieces. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Ideas out of classes and stuff. It was oh. uh, amazing I got, to, it was amazing we got to do that. <laughs> the probably the only reason why they let me, so they accepted that was because they heard mirrors. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. When they saw mirrors, they said, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> you know, so yeah, so that's why I, I got a chance to do that. Otherwise, and I and those were like same similar situations, less in school, studying. Mm. Interesting. Pointless, yeah. Point uh, pointillism, they call it. You know, yeah. twelve tone. Yeah, so uh, that was, yeah, that's what that was. And yeah. yeah, they accepted it because I. <laughs> ah, it's beautiful. I, mean, I love it. Yeah. It's beautiful stuff. Yeah, but uh, you mentioned you studied uh, classical composition and composition, but uh, I, I, want, I wanted to ask you, like, in late fifties, like uh, uh, growing up, uh, I mean, working around Washington, who were like this first jazz experience that you got? Who did you hear the first guys that kind of blew your well, mind? I mean, back then. You know, as far as listening to jazz goes, goes way back when I was a kid, little kid. My mm. my parents uh, all brought in all of the. Uh, oh well, at that time in the forties, you know, they brought in uh, the people like uh, Lionel Hampton and Lester Young. Oh man, yeah. And then uh, the, in the 40s, there was this, uh, I don't know if you know about the history of it, they call it, uh, it was uh, race music and uh, Lloyd Jordan, you heard of Lloyd Jordan? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Lloyd Jordan, he was quite popular at that time. So they brought in th that kind of stuff I was listening to very as, early. As, yeah. as a kid, yeah. Wow, it's amazing. And what about the, the, the guys, uh, when, when this creative step happened, like to the bebop and Coltrane stuff, did, did that already influence you like really early? Like when you heard that? Well, you know, now I have to give you a <coughs> semi-lecture, a lecture, I'm going to be a lecture, lecture on, on American music history is, uh during the actually well i say the 40s is the most revolutionary period in mm -hmm. american music uh, those were when all of the changes occurred yeah. in american music and so uh the i would say the uh I'm trying to use my words carefully, but there were there were a lot of uh, social political ramifications in America, in American, and associated with American music. Yeah. And one thing was the what they call the thirty percent surtax, uh, and I know you haven't heard of that. No, no. <laughs> but the thirty percent surtax was a mandate, it was a government mandate levied, uh, as I found out earlier, it was levied on ballrooms mm -hmm. where uh, the big bands occurred. Yeah. When it, it just wasn't levied on, 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 it was levied on 
games like baseball, football games, all kind of uh, classical uh, entertainment. And, uh, but it greatly affected the, the, the jazz world. Mm. 30% surtax meant it's just current around um, toward the end of the 30s, going into the 40s. Out of the so-called swing era, see the swing era was a very big and popular. Yep. It was as popular as rock and roll would ever become. And you're talking about the the dance bands, yeah, the the 30s, the Benny Goodman's, the Count Basie's, the Lucky Millinder, all of those yep. people. You say the big bands, what they call the big bands, was just as prominent as a small group today. As you see, five. You would see 17 and 18. That was very prominent. It yeah. was, you know, it was no big deal. It was, that was, was the way it was. And uh, they played for ballrooms where it had dancing. Dancing, it was like a, a, a total entertainment show. They would have MC, singers, uh, dance, and they danced and they had comedians. That's yeah. the way they, that's the way the ballrooms were. And this 30% surtax uh, almost literally destroyed the ballrooms uh, and resulted in the, uh, the small clubs. And, and it was around the same time that, you know, Charlie Parker and those people yeah. did and uh, were going into it. I would say they, they what they did was not, uh, it was affected by the, but it wasn't on their minds. They were just wanted more freedom, more creativity, individual solos, etc. So, but the the thirty percent destroyed the ballrooms. The mm -hmm. proprietors couldn't maintain the dance policy in the ballroom. So, yeah. and because they had to pay over thirty percent more than what they were normally they couldn't do it. So that. That was when they always say, what, what killed the big bands? That, that killed the big bands. Most of the uh, leaders uh, went to small groups mm, yep. and in, the in the 30s into the 40s. And so also at the same time, uh, what they call, what they were calling bebop was being nurtured. And this is what was played in the small clubs and and then they had uh, they had the the, the, uh, the no dance policy, which resulted in cabaret laws. You might have heard about this in, in specifically in New York cabaret laws. You have to have had a cabaret license mm -hmm. to maintain certain policies. If you want to do have a dance policy, you had to have a cabaret license, and the musicians had to have a cabaret card. So mm -hmm. this is yeah. what it was. So. Uh, this, the, so, yeah, um, right. So these were the uh, these were the the social uh, conditions that was occurring in, yep. in uh, American American music and all of this. The, the, the closing of the of the ballrooms resulted in the establishment of separate radio agendas. In other words, the white radio played what back then was called the hit parade, which later became the top 40. And black radio played uh, what they call race music, which later became rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. These two, they were related. They all out of the same thing. Yeah. And at toward the end of the forties, this is this is the background of how rock and roll came to be. See, uh, toward the end of the forties, when they changed the name from racial records to rhythm and blues, then some people, some business people, one guy, Alan Freed, famous DJ, yep. he got together a consortium and said, "Look, if we can get some white." artists to cover, to cover the race records, we can create a new genre and we'll call it rock and roll. Yeah. 
it's, this is in fact how rock and roll came to be. Rock and roll is a cover. They covered the race record. Every time a race record would come out, one of those people, those oh, so, oh, so many, well, Elvis and then Pitt yeah, and sure. Yeah, sure. Then yeah. They would cover, they would cover a uh, the the race record hit, and that's how rock and roll yeah. came to be. Yeah. So. So that's the, the social situation. And meanwhile, jazz was uh, jazz was going out further out of the uh, public eye. It was becoming <clears throat> when what they call the bebop era. It was yeah. uh, like beatnik music, you know. But it had a it had a strong support system. It had the, the neighborhood clubs and bars. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's that's a, a little background of what was happening in the forties. The forties is very very uh, Important, important era. Yeah. 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 That's, and how, how much, when you look back now, I mean, you being a teenager then in 50s, yeah. how did that affect you musically? Like, Well, uh, in the 50s, was, uh, I became um, introduced to, um, well, let's just say, Growing up uh, before teenagers, you, you know, you're affected by, in other words, my, my idol on drums was Gene Krupa. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know why? Because I saw, I saw him on TV. I saw him on TV. And I didn't see Max Roach on TV. Max yeah, Roach sure. On TV. Yeah. yeah, I didn't find out about Max Roach till I became a teenager. So... <laughs> You know that's that's the way it was. Like uh, that, you know, stuff that Max Roach and, and Miles and it yeah. was it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't on TV for sure. sure. It was not on TV, but it had a it had an audience. It had a it had a uh, a uh, circuit yeah. a place that where they worked. But uh, I didn't find out about it till I had, you know, I had an older buddy, uh, had a brother had introduced me to some records and I'm, you know, I was like, wow, you know. So that's what, that's what that was, you know. Yeah. First hearing the Max and them cats, you know. Yeah, amazing. But that, I, I wanted, to, just to rewind a little bit later, you, you said you started then playing in Washington. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Six nights. Okay. Six uh, nights a week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I did that at a place called the Caverns, Bohemian Caverns, oh. a famous spot. We used to call yeah. it be called Crystal Caverns, and uh, they had a group there. Where they had young guys who had a group called JFK Quintet, you know. Mm. And so we had a job six nights a week for three years. That's amazing. That's, that's the way you you got work in those days. My first job in New York was at Menton's Playhouse for like the whole summer of '64. You know, three months. That's that's the way you. That's the way you work. Yeah. In those days. Yeah. yeah. So, but w what was the trigger for you to move to New York? Then, when was that moment? How, how did you decide to do that? I mean, well, I was I was meeting everybody. You know, meeting all the people uh, coming through hmm. uh, when they would come through DC. And those days, you had uh, not only did you have the clubs, but you had the theaters. So what they yeah. call the theater is like you heard of the Apollo Theater. Yeah, sure. Well, every every major city had a big theater. DC had the Howard Theater, the, the Regal in, in uh, Chicago. Yeah. Down every and then the, those theaters featured. They featured. Uh, they featured the rhythm and blues stars, but they featured the jazz. Jazz stars. also, yeah. yeah. They had jazz shows. That was, it was very common. So those people, I met all those people like Miles, Cannonball, Train, they would, they would come down, you know. I met them down there. And then uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, Eric Doffy came and played and worked with us for about three weeks. The oh, group wow. that I was you about. He worked for three weeks. And, uh, oh, man. And so that was, uh, so he was instrumental 
you know, the Freddie Hubbard and other people, come on, you know, come to New York, bop, bop, bop. you know, you had to go to, had to go to New York sure. at some point in time, you know, in, the, in, in your life to be in the yeah. music business. You yeah. go to New York, you go to LA. Well, the people from LA, it's just a different thing, but the, New York was really for jazz, that was sure. the spot, you know. How was your experience? Uh, I mean, uh, Eric Dolphy is for me the biggest, one of the biggest heroes beside Ornette and Coltrane, I guess. And uh, how was it? What like working with with him and uh, oh, yeah, your experience? Oh, that was great. You know, he's he uh, was just you know he just came in and <laughs> we just played. You know, <laughs> and it was very. Uh, Cause he had worked with, he was working with Coltrane, you know, too. Yeah, sure. And so he was, uh, he was actually gave me some pointers about, I think he was been watching people like Roy Haynes, you know, and mm -hmm. Elvin Jones and them. So he would give me some points that I had to further, you know, when I got to New York, I found, that's when he learned, that's when I learned how to play, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. But, and, but then in New York, when I kind of look at your, what you've done immediately after Freddie's breaking point, you, you started playing with everyone and did all these record dates. But how was this first connection with Blue Note, like the first record? Well, it's, uh, uh, yeah, there's an introduction, I would say, like uh, Eric Duffy had a recording and you might, it's called Out to Lunch. Mm -hmm, sure. I mean, yeah. That, yeah. So I'm, not, I'm not even playing on it. It's Tony yeah, Williams. It's Tony, yeah, sure. But he told me, Eric told me to come to the rehearsal. <laughs> oh, wow, wow really? He said, come to rehearsal and bring music. Oh, man. What he, what he was doing was setting me up. You know, he told me to bring music. I said, okay, I, you know. So that's when I came. I brought mirrors and I. What he was doing was setting me up with Alpha Lines and those people. And mm -hmm. I brought the music and uh, Freddie saw it and said, oh, yeah, I like this. So I'm going to take it. We'll play, play, you know. Duke Pearson also, they, see, they liked it because it was, <laughs> they liked it because it was thorough. Mm -hmm. It was it had the harmonies, yeah. it had the harmony and movement. So, like I said, they said they looked at something, and this guy knows what he's doing. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> so what they had to say, oh, man, this guy knows what he's doing. But, you know, let me play this. So that was, you know, that was the intro. And then I just started getting calls and calls. People start calling, you know, to record. Yeah. And that was fine, you know. But they also knew that I, they knew that I had, uh, I wouldn't say, man, I was very thorough. They had mm -hmm. to say that after looking at mirrors. Yeah. You see, you got the music to mirrors. You see, yeah. After they looked at that, they had to say, mm. <laughs> this guy must, this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> this yeah. guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> That's what they had to say. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. No, but but the, the, then you started, uh, I mean, uh, like immediately you did like with Andrew Hill. Yeah, right. Just just started, right. How, how did with Andrew? Yeah, start? just come right in succession. So yeah, just just happened. And it was, you know, but no, just, just start getting, you know, just start getting the calls. <laughs> yeah. Like I call and I would go, you know, it just started happening. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, that's it's, it's I mean, and Sam Rivers. I mean, man, that's like that's amazing. Like yeah. those records with Sam. I mean, that the contours yeah. one. That's that's wow. That's Sam one was, of my that's one of my favorite records. Mine as too. A, yeah. As a sideman, as a player. Yeah. Sam Rivers. That's one of the That's one of the ones I like. I like that one. Yeah, with Ron Carter and Kirby, and that's. Yeah. Oh yeah! Right. Yeah. It's it's so beautiful. Those are the top guys. Yeah. 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 But the, the, you you as a drummer. You, you know, when I see the records, who you played with, I think you played with all the best bass players, like, you know, from Ron Carter, Reggie Workman, Cecil McBee, Richard Davis, right. Walter Booker. 
I mean, the, the list probably goes on and on. And but right, I, wa right. I wanted to ask you, how, how did the, this influence your playing and your learning also regarding? They all play differently in a way. Someone play more backwards ahead. Someone more like yeah. Well, the it's just you know you, you have to adjust. You know, the first thing that you must or any drummer must remember is you got to learn to accompany first. That's the first and adjust. That's you're an accompanist. First, mm -hmm. that's the first thing you have to learn as a drummer. That's a, and, and that's what that does, because uh, it teaches you. And I work with singers and all kinds of, you know, singers too, like uh, I work Gloria Lynn, I'll play with, mm -hmm. uh, Demita Joe. You know, that's all putting you in, a, you have to accompany, you have to learn how to yeah. accompany these people. So, um, that's what it was. And also it's determined by the music, you know, that you're playing. Like if you go to recording date, then Andrew Hill's writing a certain style. So you got to, you got to play that. You have to play the style. You have to play that, whatever he's trying to project in the piece. So. Yeah. I think you, you, you manage it always when I listen to all these records you did. It's just like, you're always there for the music. I mean, I don't know. You, I listened to Compulsion yesterday, and it's like all those tunes, Legacy and Premonition, and you know the Compulsion, the up tempo is like it's amazing. But how you guys merged together also musically, it's beautiful. Yeah. So, but the, with all these records, you, you mentioned also Miles, and I wanted to ask you. I listened to the Gather Walk the other day, and. Uh, how, oh, that is, mm. And how, how did that story happen with him? And uh... Uh, that came in. I really just I got a call. Who somebody called me? I think maybe Jack was just playing at him. My mother been, must have been away. I had mm. something to do. I got a call. My chick Korea called me. As a matter mm. of fact. And uh, you know, it was. Uh, I don't think too much of those records for for as for me. Yeah, I was sure. on. You know, I, I wasn't. I wasn't really, uh, I didn't grasp it. The piece out of that, you're talking about the Silent Way sessions. The yeah, the Silent Way sessions, yeah. It was uh, the Joe Zavinil piece. Early minor, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that. That was one that I, but the other ones were, I, I didn't really get a handle on it, <laughs> really, at that time. I, I, you know, I might have been a little reserved or something. I mean, mm -hmm. too reserved for, for the, but that's what that was. Yeah, but you you liked early minor so much by Joe. You even uh, then selected yeah, it for your yeah, record, yeah, right? Yeah, I played it. Yeah, I, I like that piece. Yeah. And uh, the, what was the trigger that that you decided then to 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 release or to record Almoravid? When was that moment for you that you said, "Okay, I want to become a band leader now"? I mean, as as a release an album as a band leader. Yeah, How did yeah, that I happen? Got, uh, I got a call. Oh, well, I, I can't even remember. I know I had did. Muse was the records, yeah. Joe Fields, I, you know, he, I got a chance to say, yeah, I so I did that, hmm. and that title was a little too. I, I, I regret that title, but it, oh, why? <laughs> well, that puts you in a certain people think, oh, he's a Muslim. Blah, 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 blah. Ah, yeah, okay, that's what you mean. Okay. Uh, so, but the title was that's the way I was thinking, and I, it was a little too over the top, really. I should, I should have had another title. That's because. Oh, you're educating the people, but people still, they, they, they say, oh, he must be a Muslim, you know, <laughs> you know, and like that. That's where that goes. But were you, uh, uh, when you listen to that record now, what's your view on that? I mean, because you wrote beautiful stuff. Medina has like a beautiful yeah, it melody. Okay. And like... well, it, was, uh, it was not really, it wasn't. Really wouldn't it wouldn't be if I had to record those pieces today. It would be totally. It would be different. Mm. I, those were not my favorite records. I rec recording. I will tell that. I oh, really oh, just wow. recording wise. Yeah, yeah. They, there's things that uh, some things that weren't weren't happening. You know, it was it was not not complete. Yeah. 
far as you know, far as I can. For then, for then, it was still wasn't it wasn't good recordings mm, to me. Oh wow, interesting. But the, the, did you like being in the role of band leader when you look at uh, even or even now, like? Well, yeah, it's uh, when you you know when you say band leader, it's just you, know, you really like uh, in terms of composing, you know. Com yeah, definitely. Yeah, you're the musical director, so to speak. You, you are. That's so. That's what what whatever you're, you're trying to say is. You're at. It's on your hands. It's in my hands. That's that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, but. I also wanted to ask you this, like, because you're recording wise, you're on so many records, but uh, what about touring wise, like in the 60s when yeah, you did all let me, let, me, let me ask you a question. Sure, please. You, you have, uh, where do you live in? Uh, I, I live in Slovenia. Slovenia, okay. Yeah. You, you, uh, how would you say uh, Morocco to? It's there, it's out there. How's, how's it doing? Would you? Just take a, a guess. How's yeah. it circulating? Oh, the album. Yeah. Well, you know, it's available on all the streaming platforms. That's, uh, but I don't think I, I haven't seen it in record stores here. Although, like the record stores here in Slovenia regarding jazz, it's really become bad. So, you mm -hmm. know, well, that's in, everywhere. Yeah, in Aust in Austria, I would say it's probably there everywhere. But in Slovenia, it's it's really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, for CDs, so uh, yeah, that that's everywhere too. See, so stores, the retail stores, are almost disappeared. Yeah, exactly. They, gigs. I mean, you can sell CDs. Uh, usually, when we tour on gigs, people really buy CDs actually. And but like yeah, when, in live, stores, yeah. it's like quite bad now. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and the streaming. I, I think the streaming killed it. Uh, I don't know. It's really bad because you know the artist or the label whoever gets like 0 0.0001 <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah per stream so it's impossible it's yeah but would yeah would be nice would, are you thinking of bringing this uh, album also to live concerts yeah of course yeah yeah when it, when you can happen well you know if you know what's going on with covid that's yeah yeah COVID. sure okay that's a different story i yeah. haven't knocked everything out yeah yeah sure in terms of uh clubs and uh, it's just starting to open reopen in new york as far as that's new york goes that's they're just starting to open up yeah i have something to do there september 11th i gotta do uh outdoor festival but it's not things are not where they used to be yeah yeah that way all and that's everywhere so yeah i agree yeah europe is the same it's, it's yeah restrictions and the vibe is not really the same for playing concerts as it was before because it has a certain flavor with it and it's like yeah right that's right i don't know but we'll see i, I hope you know we're, we'll swim out, yeah. out of this soup and yeah make, make it right. happen so Right, right. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing some of these thoughts, sir. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. And uh, okay. And stay strong and keep keep up the creatives. I mean, it's amazing how you do and what 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 you do and how strong you look also. Yeah. Thank so, you. It, it takes <laughs> it takes strength, I guess. It takes yeah, yeah. nerve, strength, whatever. Where it yeah. is. It's beautiful, so really. All right. It. Cool. Thank you. Thank Doctor Jazz. Doctor Jazz.